think um, I, will, uh, I will clear the palette by reading a bit from uh, my novel, A Thousand Pardons, and then uh, I'll read a brief excerpt um, from the versions. Uh, a Thousand Pardons is a, a novel about uh, uh, a woman named Helen Armstead who, um, after a kind of domestic disaster, uh, winds up unexpectedly back in the working world and dis discovers that she has um, a, a rare, completely untrained gift um, in the world of public relations, specifically uh, uh, the branch of public relations known as crisis management. Um, in particular, she discovers that she has it in her to uh, persuade powerful men to apologize. So um, this scene comes fairly early on in the novel. Um, she has uh, just been up the night before signing her divorce papers. And um, uh, recently also the, the, the man who hired her, a kind of eccentric uh, old uh, PR veteran who hired her and took a chance on her, uh, has died. So she is in the office more or less by herself. The next morning she found a message on her office desk left there the night before by Michael. A congressman called, it said. That didn't seem right, particularly when accompanied by a 718 phone number. Helen dialed it. Councilman Brapkowski's office, a woman's voice answered. Councilman, congressman, whatever, Helen laughed to herself as she sat on hold. But something about the name rang a bell. Holding the phone with her shoulder, she Googled his name and hit return, and she saw what it was just at the moment that the, the councilman's voice boomed over the line. So you are still in business, he said jovially. The guy I talked to last night told me Harvey Aaron was dead, which my condolences. You're the folks who handled the Peking grill strike, right? Yeah. An hour later, Helen was on the subway out to Elmhurst, a ride long enough to give her time to read through that day's posts and daily news, much of which was devoted to the reason she'd been called. Doug Brakowski, a two-term councilman with a wife and three teenage children, had been caught on a building surveillance camera in the Bronx beating a young woman purported to be his mistress. Mm -hmm. Helen had seen the silent 15-second clip online as she pulled her coat on. First an empty hallway, then a large figure in an overcoat pulling a much smaller woman into the frame by her long hair. She pushes away from him, hits him weakly in the chest, and then he punches her in the face. Prodding her down the stairs ahead of him, he turns to scan the hallway behind them, and at that point his face, though bloated with anger, is clearly identifiable. Please have a seat, the councilman said, closing the door behind them. His office might have belonged to a storefront lawyer with fake white paneling and a break front that looked like it was made of particle board. On his desk, facing outward, were framed photos of his family and one of himself shaking hands with Mayor Bloomberg, both men facing the camera rather than each other. Will anyone else be joining us? Helen asked. Even his smile was like a hand on her shoulder. Best to keep the loop as small as possible in times like these, I think. Here is where we stand. The young woman in question is not pressing any charges. She has been publicly named, though, and I'm sure the tabloids have all got their checkbooks out. At some point she may crack, I don't know, so what I need to figure out is how to limit my exposure. Not legally, but, well, you're the pro, you must know what I'm talking about. He was a bear of a man, red-faced even when calm, with the tracks of a comb clearly visible in his hair. Helen fought down her fear of him. Were you having an affair with this woman, Councilman? She asked. He affected surprise and smiled again. Call me Doug, he said. Is that strictly relevant to what you need to do? Yeah. She wasn't sure it was, but she found herself needing to know it anyway. Think of me as you would of a lawyer, Helen said. I cannot be in a position where I am taken by surprise by information the other side has, and I don't. He nodded. Well then, Yes, he said. Assuming we have the seal of the confessional here, I was, and am, having an affair with the young woman on the tape for about two years now. My wife, who is currently not speaking to me, did not know about it until the day before yesterday. There's no love child or anything like that. I never spent any public money on her. I never hired her for any phony campaign job. She is, he said, just this smoking hot Latina chick that I have been banging on the side, just like millions of people do all over the world every day. Does that give you everything you need to work with? She recrossed her legs and re-smoothed her skirt just to give herself a few seconds. Then with great effort, she stared back right into his eyes. The way I see it, there's really only one way for you to go, she said. You tell the woman who answers the phone out there that all media inquiries are to be forwarded to me. I will announce that you'll be delivering a statement tonight at, 
let's say 8.30, plenty of time for the late news and for tomorrow's papers. I don't know what your home looks like, but if the optics are right, we can do it there, outside, not inside. And if not, we can do it here, I suppose. A little cramped, though. And what will I be saying? The councilman asked evenly. You will admit to everything. You will apologize to this young woman by name for your violent behavior. You will not use any phrases like moment of weakness or regrettable incident. You will apologize to your wife and to your children and to your parents if they're still alive and to your constituents whether they voted for you or not and to women everywhere. Basically, you will get up in front of the cameras and make an offering of yourself. Some of the redness drained from his face as she spoke. She could feel, as she'd felt before, the power her words gave her over him. You really think that's the play, he said. That is the only play, to ask forgiveness. If you hold back in any way, the story lives. Let me ask you this. Presumably you are a man with ambitions. What do you want to happen now? What is the outcome that will put those ambitions back on the track that your own mistakes threw them off of? He tipped back noiselessly in his chair. I want to stay in office, he said. I want to be reelected. This was a stupid thing for me to have done, but it does not define me. It was a one-time thing, and I want to get away from it. You will never get away from it, Helen said. But you can incorporate it into the narrative. You have to be sincere. You have to be completely abject and not attempt to defend yourself or your behavior in any way. No, I was drunk. No, she hit me first. You have to take and answer every question. And you have to hold your temper when people try to get you to lose it. Do you think you can do that? Should my wife be there, he said. <laughs> Helen considered it. She was sure just from talking to him that, for better or worse, he could make it happen. Depends, she said. Depends on the look on her face. His eyes drifted off to one side for a few seconds. OK, probably not then, he said. Listen, don't take this the wrong way, but this had better work. It's not really my nature to get up in front of a bunch of cameras and show my ass like that. It's not about your nature. It's about everybody else's. And it will work, this way and no other. He stood and lifted Helen's coat off the chair beside her, holding it as she turned her back to him and inserted her shaking hands. You know, he said, for what it's worth, this was the first time I ever raised my hand to her. That, she said, is exactly the kind of thing I don't ever want you to say to anybody but me. It worked. She knew it would work, even without completely understanding why. In her faith in the tactic of total submission, she felt herself delivering a kind of common sense rebuke not just to her ex-husband and his lawyer, but to legal minds everywhere. She stood shivering behind the councilman, out of camera range, on the front stoop of his Elmhurst row house for an hour and 40 minutes, and he was so good she found it hard to doubt how sincere he was. Even with a unanimous motion to censure him in the city council, it was out of the news in four days. Mona, that's a coworker of Helen's, looked over Helen's shoulder as she typed up the invoice to send to Bratkowski's office. Are you crazy, she said. This is government money we're talking about. Double it. <laughs> Helen couldn't quite get herself to do that, but she did bump it up another few thousand, and they paid it without a word. A week later, Helen went through the day's office mail and found a Christmas card from Doug and Jane Bratkowski with a photo of the whole family wearing matching sweaters. You couldn't really tell anything from a photo. Still, she stood it on her desk. Right now, changing gears slightly. <laughs> um, read from, um, uh, from the virgins, and um, you know, not only have I ever read from this book, but I've never had to set it up either. <laughs> so uh, I, can, I can tell you that uh, uh, it takes place in the year 1979 at a, uh, a, a fictional prep school called Auburn Academy, and concerns uh, a, a love affair between uh, a girl named Aviva and a boy named Sung, uh, and is narrated um, by another boy named Bruce, who is um, uh, painfully on the outside, and not only of this particular relationship, but uh, uh, on the outside of um, the realm of, let's say, sexual adventure completely. All right? All right. <laughs> They're still quite new at this, but they know what to do. They put it together out of what they've read in books and seen in magazines, out of dreams, instinct, in imitation of the others, the very few they've been with. Her lips are always soft, barely parted at first. This excites him deeply, the patience she insists upon, the way she opens to him only slowly. 
She sets their rhythm, yields a little, then a little more, and once she is open and gaping, she exacts submission from him in return, plunging into his mouth, licking roughly. Then she is tender and soft again. She leads, then she lets him lead. They are young, they can kiss and press against each other for hours, gradually twisting out of their clothing. For other acts, there is plenty of time, all the time in the world. Where can they go for privacy for these hours of leisurely pleasure? There are the woods beyond the gymnasium, clearings with crushed soda cans and used condoms, and if you know how to get there, the bog, although the tree-ringed lake known by that name is populated with students getting wasted on the muddy banks. There's her room or his room on a Saturday night. Parietals are from 8 to 10 p.m., with the lights on and the door open a minimum of two inches. Many of the faculty members on duty never come upstairs to check. If they do, one can gamble on technical compliance and a cheeky argument. We thought the desk lamp counted when the overhead light is off and a tall stack of books blocks the lamp's glow. There's the bank of the river where it dwindles to a creek as it passes through the woods, and there are the alleys on Nut Street, and there's the Guignol Theater in the darkness. There are the music building's practice rooms, whose doors have a window that can be blocked by a record album cover. Faculty members, some of them anyway, pretend they don't see. There is plenty of opportunity. Sung lays his head on her breasts. He traces the deep indentation of her waist. W-O-M-A-N, he spells out, drawing the letters along the swell of her hip. That curve spells woman. She laughs. Three months ago, even three weeks ago, she was still only a girl. The gray light of late afternoon washes the floor and the bed. Sunday, Sung's room. Sung spent the hour before their meeting on the case of a prep whose homesickness is not let up, who is desperate to leave school. I'm not cut out for this place, the boy keeps saying. He cries at night, and then cries some more when he remembers that his roommate will tell everyone else about the crying. Sung called in the roommate and told him that this kind of ratting out wouldn't be tolerated. Be a man. Show some compassion, Sung said. He thinks he may have gotten through to the kid, and the homesick one has agreed to give school another week. They'll talk again next Sunday. You're a good proctor, a good model, Aviva says, splaying her hand to look at it against some strong thigh, her white skin, his olive skin. Maybe, Sung says. The kids know I break more rules than they do, so long as the faculty don't know. They know. Everyone knows. I've never been able to be all good, maybe. I'm just very good at looking good and not getting caught. There's an unspoken deal. As long as I'm not obvious, the powers let it go by. He bends and kisses the curve he so likes. Anyway, something like you, something like you can't be truly against the rules. Don't be silly. I'm not silly. A cool draft flows in through the old misaligned windows. The, the desks hold handwritten essays and class books. Jonathan Kozel, Marxism and Society, Die Leben des Jungen Werther. Thanks a lot for that. <laughs> Stern has agreed not to return until 7 o'clock. They smuggled Aviva up there, shameless. Aviva waited in the welled entranceway, chatting with Stern, looking like someone who had just dropped by to say hi. Detweiler stood sentry on the second floor, and Giddings, Detweiler's roommate, on the third. They made sure no one was moving in the corridors, then signaled down. It was easy. Ten seconds and Aviva was inside Sung's room. Sung jammed the door lock with chewing gum, just in case Mr. Glass, the dorm head, hears suspicious movement and attempts an entrance with his skeleton key. Aviva would have time to crawl under the heap of coats in the corner, so Sung says. A late October, pre-dusk silence, broken occasionally by a shout outside the window. Aviva lays herself out to Sung's touch. His fingers move slowly, sounding her. His fingers are sentient, they study and anticipate. Her veins flood. She was made for this. Sung turns around to her belly, pushing her hair to one side, and presses his thumbs hard into the muscles along her spine and wringing her neck, bunched at her shoulders. She feels herself being put together by him, piece by piece. They are young, don't forget this. Sung imagines what it would be like to be inside her, but it's like imagining a field on the other side of a distant fence, it is a place it will take time to get to, somewhere he will gain eventually, but cannot see distinctly now. She is less curious about exploring his body, or in any case, less forthright. To touch pleases her less than to be touched. Sun's hairless chest, 
though broad and strong, is tender looking, like paper that might tear under her fingers. The swelling between his legs she will cup and kiss if it is masked by the stiff fabric of his jeans, but when it is released, she finds it menacing and is afraid to handle it. There is something raw and unfinished about the thing. Its asymmetry bothers her, as does the massive gelatinous sack of balls. She loses confidence when she sees his penis. She sees herself being overpowered, forced. Nothing frightens her more. Her girlfriends back home had a game. If you had to choose, would you rather be raped or murdered? Murdered, she always answered. She climbs on top of Sung, straddles him, bends down to kiss him deeply, then straightens and withholds herself from him. He reaches up and makes a breastplate for her with his palms. She stretches out next to him, full length. He kisses her neck, shoulders, hips. He trembles with the effort it takes to be gentle. When they go to the woods, hands up under each other's sweaters, their corduroys unzipped, his briefs fill again and again with sticky ejaculate. She closes her eyes when they kiss. He watches her, always. They go on and on, then rest without talking. They daydream for a long time, and then one or the other begins the touching again. The afternoon is endless. No one will come to bother them. No one will knock on the door. Sung falls asleep with his cheek on her naked belly. Aviva listens to his quiet snoring for a while, then falls asleep too. <laughs>